So first, I want to uh, thank uh, Fred for inviting me to be part of this uh, uh, launch meeting and uh, to immediately tell you that um, I'm from across the street. So I'm a, a physician, and so I practice medicine. And uh, since this was really uh, focused on lessons from sub-Saharan Africa, I thought that I would speak to you both as someone who's lived in this country for 31 years and someone who actually was an adolescent in Nigeria. Uh, I see that there are few people who are here from Nigeria. And um, so my comments are going to be built really based on the work I do here, as well as what I've learned living in Nigeria, doing research in Nigeria, and sort of my idea about uh, the way forward. We have a network, and the network that we have started really when I went back home after I left in 1983, and the year I left, there was a military coup, and you know, hell broke down, and it's, you know, for 30 years, it was as if you know, time stood still. This week, you've been hearing a lot about Nigeria, the Nigerian government, the democracy, but I want to really emphasize the fact that if you saw the people who actually got this going, they were women. I was in Nigeria when this started, and the women were already chatting. They tried to, to suppress them, and they could not be suppressed. So my work has been on women's health and women's empowerment. And I've learned a lot, actually, going to Nigeria to see how women solve some of the problems. Next slide. So um, do, I, oh, do I advance it myself? OK. So um, we, um, when I went back, uh, after being here for about you know, uh, a little over 10 years, uh, I do breast cancer research, and uh, I re realized that uh, a lot of the problems that my patients on the south side of Chicago had were exactly what I had encountered when I was in medical school in Nigeria. It, it, nothing had changed. The cultural, the social determinants of outcomes for my patients here on the south side of Chicago were exactly what I learned in medical school from 1975 to 1980. So I went back, and then uh, when we had the opportunity to create a, a, a partnership, uh, one of my first partners was uh, Sarah Geller in the School of Social Science Administration, because I then began really interested in the social determinants of health on the south side of Chicago. And then uh, we sort of you know, began to have this Chicago partnership with uh, 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 researchers in, in Africa, uh, we started going, and I always use this word, you, you know, in the Bible it says you rob Peter to pay Paul, uh, but really, it's, I have my worried well from Winnetka, and those of you who know where Chicago is, you know where the philanthropy comes from, and then my, you know, women on the south side of Chicago who may not even have a way to eat after getting chemotherapy from me. Uh, but then, I really now I'm at this situation where I feel that that model is not sustainable and that we have to now begin to think about uh, 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 jobs, 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 jobs on the south side of Chicago. And so our partnership with uh, the School of Social Science Administration has really brought us a, an exciting program in the, um, in the graduate program on health administration and policy. And for those of you who know about GFAP, you know that it's really bringing people from different disciplines to work together. We talk about interprofessional uh, learning. And I can't get through a day as a doctor without really needing somebody who knows social science to help me with a patient. So the global health track in, the, in GFAP is really for us to begin to learn more about how people have, are solving problems in the global health arena and how that can actually help us in this country. So USAID is here uh, and I've become really interested in thinking about global disparities in health outcomes. And it's not so much about how much money you put on at it, it's about how innovation, how innovative you are, how creative you are in solving those problems. And I can tell you that some of the really interesting solutions that we're trying now in healthcare have all been piloted in Africa. So there's a lot that we need to learn. Uh, in terms of education outreach, in terms of interventions, interventions that are family-based. And so 
you know, when I came to this country, one of the things that was so striking to me was why we were so focused on the individual. It was all about personal, personal rights, the rights of the human being. Your personal rights was above everything else. And yet, growing up in a hierarchical society where, you know, guess what? If my father doesn't agree, I can't do it. Right? If my mother doesn't sanction it, it doesn't happen. So that family unit was sort of, it's the cultural basis for everything, at least we do in our culture, in the Yoruba culture. And by the way, I didn't know that I was influencing my daughter because, and I'm going to make a pitch for her book. She just wrote a book, The Bright Continent, uh, Making Change and Breaking Rules in Modern Africa. Because, you know, even though I, started, I had my kid as the first uh, thing I did in America, I raised her the way I could raise a child as a new immigrant, what I learned from home. So it was like, you can't speak to me like that. <laughs> and when she, they became adolescents and they started speaking back to us at that dinner table, my husband and I said, well, we better send them to boarding school <laughs> because we, don't, we never spoke back to our parents. So how did we survive our adolescent years? And we realized it was because we were in boarding school. So those girls that were <laughs> those girls that were abducted from boarding schools, people value education. They are from northern Nigeria. Most of what people know about northern Nigeria in this country is about Boko Haram. But I went to a federal government college with girls from the north. Parents brought them from their village. They brought ground nuts. And we all were in boarding school together. It became an equalizer. It didn't matter whether you had money or not. Nigeria was investing in education. And they got the best girls' schools, which was what I, uh, girls' education. That was what I did. And that's what got me here to be a professor of medicine. And I say that if I hadn't had that really solid foundation, when I was in Nigeria, my father telling me, you're going to be driving your car too, like that person, maybe I would not have had that motivation. So I think the host, the environmental, the social determinants, and I always talk about nature, nurture. If I was brilliant, but then my father never really believed in me or the family investing in education, I don't know if I would have been able to do some of the things that I need to do. So I think, you know, this is the framework that we like to use to do our work. And, uh, and I am glad that, you know, we were able to get uh, uh, some funding from the NIH. This is a busy slide. But basically, after doing all of this epidemiology work and community outreach, it became clear that we didn't even have enough black people participating in clinical research. So when I went back and I started studying breast cancer in Nigeria, all of a sudden, wow, you mean breast cancer is not the same? You mean some of the things that these black women have been saying are true? When Sarah Gela and I went to the community and we, and, the, and we asked them, breast cancer, what do you know about it? It's a death sentence. Why is it a death sentence? They've never seen anyone who survived it. For them, that's their reality. But when you look at it in the, in, the, in the textbook, it's a myth. It's not a myth, right? It turns out that when they get that type of aggressive breast cancer, it doesn't matter what we do, they die. And so that's why we've been really focused on getting research that will drive policy, that will get the evidence to get policy. And what we found is that you can build research capacity, you can do all the ethics and standards you want, you can do a lot of training, and that's what's been going on in a lot of South Sub-Saharan Africa. But if they don't have practical experience and there's no infrastructure to actually uh, do the work, then these people continue to suffer. That's what we also found on the south side of Chicago. We tell women to go get mammograms, but there are no mammography units on the south side. We tell them to go find a doctor, but there are no doctors on the south side because there's no economic power for them to purchase those services. So they don't put their, 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 their offices there. They go to where the money is. So right now, I'm going to where the money is. And the money is in South Saharan Africa. You know why? Because you know, six of the fastest growing economies are in South Sa Sub Sub Saharan Africa. And we've been so focused on the old model of there's no money. They have money. All my, my colleagues who didn't leave Nigeria are richer than me because they fund me when I go home, right? They fund, they're going to fund my daughter's wedding because I can't even afford it, <laughs> right? So 
our approach is let's figure out how we can do uh, uh, clinical research capacity in low to middle income countries. In the instance, Nigeria has become a middle income country, uh, that the doctors there are eager, they want to work. And so we're sort of you know, thinking about how to train them, how to support them, and how to really bring industry to come to South Saharan Africa. Just like we're asking people to bring jobs to the south side of Chicago, for grocery stores to come and put you know, fruit markets and get economic empowerment on the south side. That's what we're doing. So let me end by saying that um, I've become really quite uh, keen about these partnerships that we have to foster. Academia, we can't, and th that's a, the, the challenge in sub-Saharan Africa. Academics are still in the ivory tower. They're not getting to the community. They are so far removed, so much education. The patients are ignorant, and they need to get uh, to be empowered to think about their health and well-being. And then we have to get you know, pharma and people to invest in a health infrastructure. So I'm going to end by saying that the problems of people of African ancestry will not be solved until we begin to think about the African diaspora. Uh, the people who are in the diaspora, many of them are going back home now and are looking at investment. So I'm hoping that both African Americans on the south side and those who are on, on sub-Saharan Africa will now get moved into this clinical research enterprise. Because until we get people studied, until we get the diseases studied and we have infrastructure, we're going to make policies and try to do interventions, and they're going to fail woefully. So thank you for your uh, attention. Sickle cell disease is a disease of children. A lot of adolescents in Africa suffer from it. We need to provide social services for those uh, 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 patients, and yet there are not enough doctors to even make the diagnosis of sickle cell disease in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Because I'm a geneticist, that's why I wanted to end with this particular uh, slide. Globally, 300,000 newborns per year. In Nigeria alone, 150,000. Now, if you want to understand sickle cell disease and get to the root of it and develop new interventions, where are you going to do your studies? It has to be where the money is, where the people are. And so, thank you very much. Thank you.